Uh, I'm James Seddon. I'm a Navy veteran. I deployed to Afghanistan in 2009 and 2010. And this is my piece, Helpless. Our helplessness began before we got there and hasn't stopped. Most of us who served in Afghanistan did not specifically choose to go there. And what location we were assigned to and for what purpose was certainly beyond our control. At the least, we all sacrificed time with our families. Countless special moments missed. It also, too often, required a sacrifice of sweat, blood, tears, fear, and trauma. If, how much, when, and how, all out of our control. Any control we had was mostly illusionary. We were trained to spot explosive traps, yet a well-hidden one would kill us. We learned where the nearest safe bunkers were, but an enemy rocket at the wrong time would hit us anyway. An attack on my base's front gate would have killed me had it occurred 45 minutes later, or if my mission had been earlier. Instead, it killed Afghan children, friends of mine. Two days later, I ate lunch with someone just before he left on the mission that killed him on the Jalalabad Road, a route I also sometimes took. He never came home. I came home intact, physically anyway. Nothing he or I did decided which way it ended. It was beyond us. Being there made the place real in a way it isn't to most Americans. It was an actual place you could go to. We did go. The children, all the people weren't abstract. We learned their names. We trusted them, distrusted them, laughed with them, laughed at them, cursed them, mourned them, loved them, just like all of us do with all people. We all tried to do good, and we succeeded and saw other good things around, and we failed. We saw or did bad things ourselves or did nothing while bad things happened. Some of us believed in the mission. Some were disillusioned. Yet each of us had an opportunity every day to do something about what was happening. Even if it didn't matter in the end, it wasn't nothing. That helped. Back home, we lost that. The truth is, we could never control our country's strategy or whether the Afghan military believed it could win on its own or whether their leaders would lead with dedication and without corruption. It all ended in catastrophe. The Taliban celebrated in the very places we struggled to prevent this exact result. We recognized those places in the pictures they were sharing on the internet because we took pictures with those exact backdrops too. We knew better than most Americans, what Taliban rule meant for the Afghans, for the young girls, and for the thousands who helped us in any way despite the mortal risk that meant for them and their family. I looked at the picture of an Afghan man who worked on my base and was so very tolerant as he helped me with my Dari language skills. I remembered his name clearly, but I didn't write it for this story. The Taliban are mining the internet for the identities of our allies, swearing to hunt them down. What must he be feeling tonight while I sit here bathed in safety? I reached out to Afghanistan war buddies, both military and State Department friends. It was somehow a comfort to learn that the collapse hit everyone hard. Even those who thought all along that this was going to be the inevitable result were still shocked and horrified. There was no, told you so, I knew it. It was all, this is horrible, and I am struggling. We were struggling to figure out what our service now meant. A good buddy and combat veteran said the Taliban had undone any good he did there, and his sacrifices were for nothing. I did not want him to feel that way. I imagine many Americans felt helpless about the horrible images coming out of Afghanistan after Kabul's fall. I believed we who had been there, civilian or military, felt that helplessness more keenly than most because we were once doing something about it. 
As my tears flowed watching images of terrified Afghan children, I raged that there was nothing I could do. For two weeks, Americans, military and civilian, engaged in an effort more heroic, more perilous, and more noble than any I experienced there. At the huge cost of the lives of 13 of them, and, I am sure, lifelong trauma for many others, they saved the lives of tens of thousands of people, one final surge of goodness in Afghanistan. Yet, they were helpless to save everyone who deserved it. They couldn't get close. One left behind was an Afghan man who worked on our bases for 10 years and was now fleeing the Taliban. He found me on the internet and reached out to me desperate for help and guidance. I tried to get him entered in various databases of those awaiting evacuation and strove to understand the impossibly bureaucratic rules associated with visas. Was he contracted with the US or NATO? Was it before or after January 1st, 2015? It mattered for which visa he could apply for, or maybe it didn't. The State Department's instructions were not clear and even referred to going to an embassy that no longer exists. It was nearly impossible for me to understand. And I sat in complete comfort and safety with a large computer screen and stable internet and could study the instructions that were written in my language, not his. He worked on a tiny phone screen with sketchy internet in a language not his own while being hunted. I contacted the contractor who had paid him and got the contract number only to discover they were a subcontractor for a different company and contract, as if the Taliban would also care about these nuanced details if they caught up to him. If they checked his phone at a Taliban checkpoint and discovered his conversation with me, they'd simply kill him. And his story was only one of thousands of nearly identical cases. He wrote to me as I tried to figure out his case's status, saying, I have God first, and I have you second to help me. That poor guy, I thought when I read that. I'm a complete and helpless idiot. He deserved so much better than me as his helper. Was I really helping or only handing out false hope? But I couldn't bear to do nothing or to just ignore him. I replied to him, it is good that God is powerful because I am not. Meanwhile, I visited my favorite news sites. Afghanistan was no longer to be found there. I saw stories about the next Jeopardy host, the lawsuit against Marilyn Manson, an Alabama mom who got in a fight with an 11-year-old on a school bus, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's Time magazine cover, all apparently more newsworthy than the plight of our Afghan allies we left behind. Not even a month had passed, and Americans had already moved on to the next season of The Bachelorette. The final betrayal of Afghans by America was well underway. What could I do? I guess only this. Veterans and civilians who served in Afghanistan need to hold our head up and tell all of our stories, good and bad. The good can't be denied. The terrorist organization behind 9-11 that was based in Afghanistan and sworn to our destruction have themselves been destroyed, unable to attack us again. The last 20 years of numbers behind life expectancy, healthcare access, cell phone and internet proliferation, infant mortality, education overall, and for girls in particular, all tell the story of the good we accomplished. Whatever happens next is on the Taliban. If we are struggling with our story, we need to reach out for help. Maybe we can continue to fight for Afghans. Thousands of Afghan allies will be coming to their new home here in the United States. We need to counter messages that they need to assimilate, are lazy, are taking our jobs, are dangerously unvetted, or other untrue tropes unjustly thrown at refugees from everywhere. They need our help and welcome instead, as they helped and welcomed us at great risk. There are, there are organizations that any of us can support in this work. Maybe that's better than nothing, maybe. 
or maybe any sense of control is still just an illusion.